All right, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> so today is a very special day, right? Please, can you help us out, right? So today is a very special day. <clears throat> it's my birth... No, I'm just kidding. That was Friday. It's Mother's Day, right? So, so here's what I want to do, right? If you are a mom, a soon-to-be mom, right? If you... Uh, in the, just to kind of share with you, sometimes Mother's Day for some ladies can be very painful because they've not been able to to get pregnant, and so each, each time we have Mother's Day, I want to say for those of you moms who are struggling with that, we believe by faith that God can do it, and yeah. we're going to ask you to join. Yeah, by the way, you can clap in church, it's okay. God's alive, right? <laughs> Am I like at Yosemite? Is there like glaciers and uh, rock formations everywhere, or what? The rocks cry out in worship. It's a good idea that humanity cries out in worship, right? You believe God can do something? Yeah. All right. One person. All right. It's good. It's good. So if you are a mom, soon to be mom, or you're just going to believe by faith today that God's going to make a way for you, we want you to stand, all right, and then remain standing. I'll give the guys some direction, all right? So ladies, all right, so... I was thinking last night, I was wondering, like, how long will they stand? No. So this is what I, this is what I was thinking. All day? You'll stand all day? Let's see. So this is what I was thinking. Guys, look around. If it was up to us, there would be Adam and Adam. God said, Adam, be fruitful and multiply, and he's like, is there anything else? <laughs> right? And so we need to show our appreciation to these ladies. And so I want you to, with enthusiasm, with excitement, with joy, I want you to shout the roof off, but not too far because we don't have insurance anymore on it. But we want you to applaud these wonderful moms who are standing. So one, two, three. <laughs> Keep going. They wiped your fanny. I know you can't say wipe in church. All right. Enough. Hey, you may run the show in your house, but in my house, I run the show, and this is my house. So let's pray for the ladies who are standing. Father, thank you for just this special day of you've carved out for us to just pause and celebrate, but Lord, our, the reality in our heart is we should celebrate our moms each and every day. And Father, I just pray a special blessing upon the moms who are standing and perhaps, Lord, there's a lady here today that is believing by faith that you're going to make a way where it seems to impo be impossible. And, Lord, we just believe that as a church, that you are a God who makes all things possible. And we hold them up to you, and we pray a special blessing on them. Father, thank you for the directions, uh, the guidance, the direction, the love, the nurturing that our moms have given us. And, Father, I just pray a very special blessing on all the ladies who are standing. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said... Now you can be seated. So y'all good? Well, that's all I have today, so we're going to take the offering and go home. All right? <laughs> that's good. I'm going to tear your head right off. So here we go. So, hey, we're going to end today on our house. I had like nine guys leave, and they, were in, uh, they, were, uh, they had traction. They had Band-Aids all over, and the guys were like, dude, you're killing me today. And I said, don't worry. Next week will get a lot better for you. So come on back next week as we talk about temptation and how ladies cause a lot of that in our life. No, I'm just kidding. All right? So, hey, we're going to end this series at the dining room table. So inside your program is an outline. I want to encourage you guys to fill it out. There's passages, uh, verses to read, fill in the blanks. And all that stuff. So y'all ready? Yeah. All right. 
So <clears throat> let's just kind of imagine, I don't know what your house looks like, but after church we're all going to go there. And so imagine there's a dining room table, and in my house, as I shared last week, when I was a kid there were a lot of great conversations that took place, and then some maybe not so much. And I was surprised that my mom could leap over a four-foot table and grab me by the throat in the nanosecond. And right, maybe you grew up in that kind of environment where there were a lot of tough conversations and some good stuff. Right? But, but I want you to imagine as we've been going through the series on house, uh, rooms in our house and how they represent relationships in those areas. And so just to recap, in case you're new here today. So in week one, we looked at the front door and we talked about healthy relationships and boundaries. And we talked about that in a healthy relationship, there are two ingredients, grace and truth. And that in order for to have a healthy relationship, you need those two. And then we looked at the children's room. And we looked at the five to one ratio when it comes to faith, that you need five uh, adults aside from mom and dad who are speaking faith into the life of the child for that faith to stick and, uh, and, and growing. And there are seasons in, life, uh, seasons in life that we need to speak into the kid's life at different ages and different seasons. And then we looked at the blended family. We got the two doors up here that the vast majority of our culture, unfortunately, comes from a blended family and it's a complicated thing. And so how do you balance out the complications of a blended family? We looked at the master bedroom and intimacy and no, it's not what you're thinking, but we looked at dual submission where Paul talks about that we are to submit to one another in the relationship. And in that we learned a phrase that all, everyone in this house has written down. And that phrase is to say what to your spouse or the person you're in a relationship. What is it? What good, you guys are awesome. What can I do to help out? And it's the idea that it's dual submission, that both, that both people are looking to meet the other person's needs, right? And so we need to, we need to do that. And then last week we looked at conflict. And we looked at conflict has many ways of kind of wrestling with it, but there's only one source. And that source is, I want my way. And that's what James says. And so we looked at the conflict as we kind of last week talked about the dining room table. So today we're going to wrap it up and we're going to talk about a gift that God wants to give you. And that is the gift of wisdom. And how wisdom in your home can change it from a very chaotic environment to a place that is very subtle, or settled and kind of uh, um, calm and everybody is at, at, a, at a good place mentally and all that kind of stuff. And so let's talk a little bit about that today. So in your outline, we've been looking at this scripture verse throughout the series. In Proverbs 24 verse 3, it says this, by what? By Wisdom, a house is built, and we're not talking about construction, we're talking about relationships in the house, and through, what's the word? It is established, verse 4, and through, the rooms are filled with, what are they? Rare and beautiful treasures, meaning that when we apply into our home this idea of understanding, wisdom, and knowledge, that when we take God and we apply him into our home, that the relationships are rare and beautiful. And if we exclude God from the picture, guess what? They're not rare, they're common, and they're not beautiful, right? And so today we're going to talk about how that wisdom is, uh, is kind of le- launched into our home life, and so specifically as we talk about the dining room table. Y'all ready? So today's message is three hours and 15 minutes, so I hope everyone's got a little time to hang out with me today. I don't have anything else to do, so I figured what better to do than hang out with a great bunch of people like you. James chapter 3, if you have your Bibles. You guys there? James 3, 13. Here's what it says. Who is wise and understanding among you? So this would be the cool thing. James just kind of, he, he, just, he just parked his donkey out there. He tied it up to the hitching post out there. So he comes cruising in. He's got his long schmock on. He walks in, cruises up to the front of the stage, and then he does what every good communicator does. He baits you into buying into something. He's like, okay, hey, who is wise amongst you? And you know there's always a few people that are going to raise their hand because that's they just like that. And so it's like, who is wise amongst you? And so he's anticipating that they're going to like raise their hand and go, oh, I am. And then James is going to go, guess what we're going to do? As soon as we say amen at the end of the service, we're going to go to your house and we're going to watch you at your dining room table in your relationships. And we are going to determine based on how you act amongst the relationships that you have, whether you're wise or not. Why not wisdom was about smarts, education, 
He's going to say, no, it's not. In fact, it has little to do with that. And he goes on and he says this. Let him show it by his good, what is it? By deeds done in the, yeah, this is what we looked at last week, right? That comes from wisdom. So here's what he's going to say in your outline. That wisdom is a lifestyle. Wisdom in your house, it's not a degree, it's not a plaque, it's not a certificate, it's not I've gone through so much school and I got so many of this and so many of that. It has nothing to do with that. Wisdom is a gift that God gives us and wisdom is revealed in our life and more specifically in our relationships that we have. And if you sit at your dining room table and you just kind of observe what takes place, is it a place that's filled with chaos, and I don't mean kids being kids and they're going to be kids, but is it a place that is turbulent? Is it it a place where people say, when I walk over there, I'm not really sure what I'm going to walk into. I feel like I'm walking on glass or eggshells, and I'm not sure who that person's going to be when I open the door. And James says, if you raised your hand and say, you have wisdom, the simple test is this, it's your lifestyle. And if you peel it away, it's really your relationships that you're in. Y'all with me? So in your outline, a lack of wisdom causes problems in relationships. A lack of wisdom causes problems in relationships. And James is just saying, we're all going to take a field trip over and we're all going to sit at the dining room table and we're going to watch how you handle the relationships that you have. And if you have wisdom, then there isn't going to be the turbulent, chaotic type of situation. There's going to be a sense of calmness. But if you lack wisdom in your life, and we're going to talk about how you get that, when you lack wisdom in your life, it's going to be turning over. There's going to be lots of turbulence in the relationship. So here's what he says, verse 14. But if you harbor bitter envy or selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. In other words, we looked at this last week. Don't walk around bragging on, I told her what to do. I said that I told him I'm running the show. Don't be a fool because that's what the Bible says. You would be a fool if you did that. And at the same time, don't walk around denying the truth. When you're sitting at the dining room table, listen, if it's a mess, it's a mess. Own it. Make the adjustments in your life, right? God changes and transforms our life. Don't you believe that? He can change a chaotic environment and turn it into a calm environment. And he says, so don't deny it. And don't walk around patting your back thinking you're all that in a bag of chips, Verse 15, such wisdom, right, in quotes, does not come down from where? But what is it? In other words, it's in you, right? It's fleshly. It's I want my way. It's I want to do what I want to do. He says it's earthly, and then he says it's unspiritual, and then he says, you want to know what you look like when you have it? Here's what you look like. You look like you're the devil. Now just pause for a moment. So some of you are right, because you've been calling him or you've been calling her the devil. That's it. That's the verse you need right there. You can go home now, right? And and so he says, when you have that in your life, that's what you look like. It's fleshly, it's earthly, and it's really ugly, right? It's really ugly. Verse 16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, and that's what we you know, talked about in the dual submission idea, what can I do to help, conflict, I want my way. When you have that selfish ambition, you will find disorder, circle the word disorder, and every evil practice. And here's what you'll find. When you lack wisdom in your house, he says that you will have disorder, and the word which is in the definition right below it, it simply means this, confusion, and it comes from instability. In other words, when you walk into a house that's filled with a person or who has a bunch of people in there who lack wisdom, it's going to be constantly turning over, right? And I say this in in, in premarital counseling. Monday needs to look like Tuesday that looks like Wednesday that looks like Thursday. A healthy marriage is a flat line. It isn't this, right? Because there's a sense of stability. There's a sense of, uh, of lack of confusion and it doesn't mean there's no spontaneity or any of that stuff. It, it just, it's, it's flatline. The relationship is stable. Y'all with me? 
So there are six marks of wisdom. So let's have a little fun. You guys seem a little tight. You guys okay? You, are, you guys are think you're going to get run over or something today? In fact, let's do this because you guys seem a little bit. Let's all stand up. Simon says stand up. All right. Maybe you guys just need to little, do a little stretching. You need a little stretch a little bit. Crack your neck because I'm going to break your neck in a few minutes. All right. All right. <laughs> Look to your neighbor and say, God's going to change you today. Say it like you mean it. All right, now sit back down. Someone asked me, is there a difference between first service and second service? It's like, it's like ice cream and yogurt. Six marks of wisdom. Here's what he says. If you have your Bibles, verse 17 goes on. He says, but the wisdom that comes from where? Who, who wants that? Right? I, I want that. Wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. And so here it is. And it says the first step, right? And I don't believe that God randomly selects words. I think oftentimes in Scripture, the reason why things are listed one, two, three is because there's a reason behind it and that he wants it in there because there's a foundation here. When it comes to wisdom, he says the first one is pure. And you can write this down uh, in your outline. Pure is uncorruptible, right? It's uncorrupted. It's, it's, it's pure from fault. And it is the word that we get integrity okay integrity now why is that listed number one why isn't peace loving number one because if it's peace loving everyone would get along and it'd all be good and the truth is this the reason why it's number one is because for a relationship to work you have to have trust and you have to have truth in it if you do not have trust and truth in a relationship it is going to just erode the, the relationship. If there's an area of, of, of distrust, if there's an area of truth in it, it is going to eventually erode the relationship. You're always going to be suspicious. You're always going to be wondering. You're always going to be questioning. And as a result of that, you are not going to have a stable relationship. It is going to be a fractured relationship. And so that key cornerstone in the relationships that, that James is talking about is the idea of integrity, that you have integrity, that there's truth, that there's trust. As I mentioned in the relationship, there's grace and truth in there. When we look at our relationship with, with Christ, you have grace when you screw up and you have truth for him to direct us in the direction that we need. And so it is in our earthly relationships that those same things uh, need to be true as well. Y'all with me? Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, and then what is it? Peace-loving, right? <clears throat> Number two in your outline, and this is a mark of wisdom, is that I will not push your buttons intentionally. Now, no one look, nobody elbow, no one cough, no one, <clears throat> right? None of that stuff. We already know, right? We already know. And so here's what's funny about relationships. If you're married for like, let's say, five days or so, you know what button to push, don't you? You know exactly the words that you need to say to get a little reaction, don't you? And you walk in the door and you're like, you know what? If I just say this magic formula, burp, 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 whatever it is, we're going to watch her head or we're going to watch his head just spin around. He's going to levitate. So we're, hey, kids, come on, let's watch, right? It's going to be like a show. And you're just going to say, and then all of a sudden, boom. And how crazy is that? How crazy is it? Why is it that we say the most hurtful things to the people that we love the most? Right? You wouldn't say it to the guy down at the, at the hardware store. He'd hit you in the head with a hammer. Right? But why do we think that we have a right in a house to say that? Right? And, and, and we know. And so we intentionally, oftentimes, uh, uh, we intentionally go around and we, you, we push the button. Well, the Bible says, not Pastor Dan, I'm just, the, I'm just the mailman. The Bible says you're a fool if you do that. You're a fool if you walk in and you're saying things just to kind of create chaos in the house. You lack wisdom, right? You lack wisdom. And again, scripture would say that you're a fool. 
And so we know those phrases. Why, why do you say that? And I, and I say to guys when I meet with them privately, listen, guys, listen. If what you say to your wife is not building them up, shut your mouth. Don't say it. Call me up. Tell me. As I jokingly said, I'll pick up the phone. I'll listen. I'll grunt every once in a while. I'll moan. I'll go, oh, dude. And then I'll hang up. Right? But, but you've got to be cautious of what you're saying in their life. And so you need to make sure that you're, 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 you're thinking through hurting people hurt people, and we'll get into that in a moment, but you just have to make sure that you're cautious of it and know that there is a button to push, and you know that button. A buddy of mine wrote a book, What Makes You Tick and What Ticks You Off, right? Because we know in the relationships, close relationships, what it is, that magical little formula. Verse 17, you guys glad you're here today? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Verse 17 goes on, it says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, then it's peace-loving, and then what is it? Considerate, right? Considerate. And considerate means mindful of the feelings of others, all right? So just imagine the relationship. Imagine there, there's trust, there's integrity. There isn't the intentional, let's push this button, right? Let, let's not do that. And then there's a desire to really listen to what's taking place in the relationship of what's going on amongst the people that you care the most. I mean, how would that not transform most relationships, right? If we just stopped right there, it would probably completely change that if, if we did it. So here are two common mistakes that we make in relationships. And, and, you know, again, I'm going hard on the guys, but I love you guys, man. I want nothing but the best for you. But this is some of our shortcoming as guys. We don't think like women. It's like the government, like, give some college like 20 gazillion dollars to figure out the difference between men and women. And in my mind, this is how I sit and think. I'm like, buy me a Happy Meal. I could tell you in like 10 minutes that guys are different than women, right? And then I could play with a little toy they gave me and we can all go home, <laughs> right? And so they scratch their head. It's like, we don't understand. Guys are different than women. It's like, hello? All right, just me? Or am I the only goofy guy in the room or what? All right, just checking. We're all going to stand and scratch each other's back if you don't make, start making some sense here. So here's two common mistakes that we make. Number one, when it comes to the feelings of others, we react to what people say and we ignore how people feel. Okay? This is gigantic in relationships. We focus on what they said. She said. He said. He called me. She called me. And we focus on the word, right, whatever that phrase is that they use, and we never stop and we never step back and we never ask, why do they feel that way? Remember through the whole series I said the biggest mistake when it comes to relationships is we attack the symptoms and we never peel the onion away to get to the root cause of it, right? It's chloroseptic with, 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 uh, with strep throat. You can get a gallon of that stuff. You can spray it. It'll numb you for like 10 seconds. It will never solve the strep throat issue, right? And as long as you're attacking the symptom, you will never get to the root cause. And when we look at the phrase, he said, she said, we never stop and come back and say, why does she say that? Why does she feel that way? Which is the most important thing. Or why does he feel that way? Y'all with me on that? So it's, it's a little bit more complicated because we get stuck on it. And we all know this. We're hurting people hurt people. We, we, we're hurting inside. We don't know how to articulate our feelings. And so what do we do? We know that there's hot buttons to push. We know there's phrases to use. We know there's things that are going to be hurtful. And so we're hurting. And so we just spew them out, right? They focus on those words. And they know what phrases that they can say and that they can do to send it right back to you. And so, whoop. Here it comes again, right? And as a result, the relationship never moves forward because all you're focusing on is arguing about the words and you've never got to the truth as why does she or why does he feel that way? Y'all with me? All right, so we got three people that are on board. So I'm glad that we're in a little dinghy and uh, we're paddling along. The next one is this, and it's going to sound a little bit like a contradiction, but it isn't. And that is that I invalid any, uh, invalidate any feelings that 
that I don't feel myself. Okay? And so we're listening not at words, but we're asking ourselves, why do they feel that way? And the worst thing that we can say to them is, I, you know, she may say, I feel ugly. You're not ugly. The girl I dated last, she was ugly. <laughs> right? That's never a good thing to say. All right? So, so you, you don't want to, you, you want to ask, and then kind of a serious note, you want to step back and you want to ask, why would my wife feel ugly? Right? Why would she feel like she's a single parent if she's not? Why would she feel like we're not having, there's no real marriage here? Why would he feel like I'm not paying attention to him, right? And, and so we don't want to just discount the feeling that they're having. But what ends up happening in relationships is we argue the feeling. You have no right to think that I don't love you. I go to work every day. I work hard. I but, 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 but. And you just fill in all the blanks. So it's kind of like this. If you have somebody who says, I feel lonely or I feel afraid, you walk into the room like, don't be afraid. Oh, I'm no longer afraid. Thanks. Thanks. I'm already way better, right? You know, are your kids crying and you walk in your room, tell me what parent hasn't done this? I said stop crying. <laughs> Dad, I am so happy right now. I'm just, this is awesome. Thank you, right? If you didn't do it, I'd cry like for all week, but now I'm a new person. You can't argue someone's emotion. You sympathize with it. You try to wrap your arm around it. In many cases, it may not even be a right emotion that they're feeling. However, they are feeling it. And when we argue their feeling, we're undermining or we're minimizing who they are. And that's why in relationships, you argue the fact. The fact is, I feel like I'm a single parent because you never come home from work when you say you're going to. The fact is, you're married to your job and not me, right? That's a fact that we want to argue. But the emotion of, I feel like I'm a single parent, arguing that part, you're never going to move forward in the relationship. Y'all with me? Yes. Relationships are complicated, aren't they? Yes. Verse 17. You guys are hilarious. But wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, peace-loving, considerate, and what is it now? Submissive, right? And this is a different word from Ephesians chapter 6. In fact, this is the only time that it's ever used in all of it, in all of the, the New Testament. And this word means reasonable, willing to listen to, uh, and open, uh, open to ideas, all right? So this is the idea that my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts, this is opposite of that. This is, I'm willing to listen to what you're expressing, what you're saying, and I'm going to be reasonable in it. I may not necessarily agree with it. I may not think it's legitimate. I may completely be 180 degrees off of it. However, I'm going to be willing to listen because I want to be open to what's taking place in the relationship. So number four in your outline is that I will be willing to listen to other people. And I think oftentimes we get into a mindset where we instantly, as soon as they say, I feel, we attack. Right? You don't have a right. You shouldn't. I work hard. You know, blah, 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 all that stuff. And we go after it and we never peel our ways, our, our, ourselves back and take a, take a step back and ask, why are they feeling this way? And is it something that I'm not open to? Am I close to? And in church life, and it drives me crazy when I hear people say, I heard a pastor say once, never let the sun go down on your anger. So we got to resolve it tonight. And I say, you are a fool if you're trying to argue and, and you're going to try to resolve it that next day or that night before you, go to, before you go to bed. What it means is you don't sweep it under the rug to forget about it. In fact, some of you have been married for any length of time, you know this. Some of the best things that you can do for relationships is to just sleep on it. Because you may wake up with a whole different perspective. And you may realize, you know what? I was arguing over something that I was, that, that, that's just wrong, right? Or you forgot what you're arguing about. You ever do that? 
Now, what were we arguing about? Because it was good, honey. Let's, I mean, let's, let's finish this thing. I want to go at it, right? And, and so, you know, take notes, please. And so we want to make sure that we're open to and we're listening to others in our life. And if you're the person that we talked about last week, if you're the litigator that you would, you would argue with a fence post, then you're the type of person that you thrive on that. The problem is that is not a mark of wisdom. Okay? That is not a mark of wisdom. Verse 17, it goes on and it says it's full of mercy and what else? Good fruit, right? So number five, and here we'll listen to the crickets. Number five is this, that I will not keep, say it loud, score. Is there any score? Don't say anything. Is there any scorekeepers in here? Yeah. Now think about this. Here, here's, here's the way it looks. Honey, I forgive you. I mean, I know you're, and I, I forgive you. Right? That's Monday. So Wednesday, he steps in it again. Pause. File cabinet. <laughs> Been married for how long? Two weeks. <laughs> oh, here it is. Oh. All right. Now, I forgave you. All right? Right? In 1976, when Jimmy Carter was president, you were wearing that gray leisure suit. Do you remember that? We were standing next to my mom's avocado green refrigerator. And if you're a millennial, you have no idea what avocado green is. You can go look at it and you can go Google it. You'll figure it out. And you were right next to those beads that were hanging down in the doorway. And you said, and then you did, and then you rolled your eyes like, and then, right, blah, 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 right, all that stuff. And, and, and then here's what's funny about those people. It's like, where did I put my keys? It's like, <laughs> wait a minute now. You don't know where you put your keys away, but you're like, oh, oh no, I don't keep score. I forgive like God forgives. I just, hold on a second. I got one. Oh, there it is right here. Okay. Got another one. So let me just kind of share with you. The wisest, if you will, being in the universe, God, looks at your sin through Jesus and says, I forgive you, and I remember your sin no more. I bury it in the depths of the sea, and I practice amnesia about your sin. Here is a hard, hard thing to grab a hold of. That if we are a scorekeeper in relationships, I'll, I'll just be very honest with you. Your relationship will never move to, into an area where you would want a healthy, happy, prosperous relationship. Because we are always stepping in it, aren't we? Always. And if you are the person that's constantly pulling it up, pulling it up, pulling it up, it will be so difficult for you to move forward in that relationship. Now, there may be a moment where there is grace, but there's also truth in it, right? And this is a hard fact for some of us. I'm not saying because you step in it every single day that you just kind of go, ah, no big deal. Boys are going to be boys. I mean, what's a little bit of, you know, that kind of stuff. You have to realize that God wants you to change, that he wants us to be and reflect the image of Jesus. And there has to be some changes in our hearts, right? But, but to just keep pulling it up and keeping score and keeping score, you're never going to be able to move forward in that relationship. Y'all with me? So get rid of the scorecard. If you want to keep score, go down to the park and you know, volunteer at the softball game. Keep score with those guys, all right? Verse 17 goes on. It says, it's impartial. And what is it? Sincere. <clears throat> Sincere means straightforward without hypocrisy, right? The Greeks are the ones who invented theater. In those days that an actor or an actress would be called a hypocrite. 
And what that meant is that they would have one or two actors that would do a whole, whole, whole show. They wouldn't have 50 or 60 different people in the show. They would have one or two people, and they would hold a mask over their face. And they were called hypocrites. And what the, it, it basically means masked. It means that you're pretending to be somebody that you're not. And so, so they would come out and they would pretend to be whoever the person is, the character of the play, and that's how they would pretend. And, and James says, you cannot have that hypocrisy, that pretending in the relationship. There has to be a time where you're honest about what's taking place. And, and when you think about relationships, and this is how crazy it is, if you're in the dating scene, that, that is a place that's filled with hypocrisy. Right? I mean, th just think about it, ladies. You, you're on there, you know, now it's all internet stuff. It's like the guy types in, I love shopping, walking on the beach, right? <laughs> Long, intimate conversations. I love talking about deep things and all this other stuff. Now, listen, maybe you're one of those guys, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know any of them. <laughs> Zero. I don't know any guy who enjoys shopping. Now, there, there may be one, but we are hunters, right? And if you're like me, I pull into a shopping center. My wife can attest to this. I got the seatbelt off, the door open, and we're still moving, <laughs> right? And I'm out the door, and I'm like 20 yards away, and I'm like, Tammy, where are you? And she's just getting her stuff, and right, pull, getting all of the things ready. I'm like in the store ready to attack, I'm going to go in there and slay the loaf of bread. We're going to get the bread, and I'm going to get out. And then when God really has a sense of humor, I always get the person who doesn't know how to use the cash register at the self-checkout, right? And so it's like, wonk, 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 wonk. I don't need the bread. Let's get out of here. We're going to make bread, right? And, and my wife, oh, let, oh, 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 look at, oh, clearance, oh, right? Be honest, isn't it true? Right? So, so that's the dating time. And, and, and the guys, and maybe if you're a bachelor and you have the lady over, it's like you clean the house, you put the dishes away, you flush the toilet, right? <laughs> you got all that stuff aside. And they come in, they're like, oh, wow, what a bad, your mom, she really trained you well. That's nice. You know, you're vacuuming. I see the vacuum marks in you. You haven't vacuumed in 22 years. Right? So then you walk down the aisle, right? And pastor's up here. And now I pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. And I go, woohoo! And then you get back from your honeymoon. And here's what the guy does with his shoes. <laughs> right? And she comes home. She's like, what are those? It's my shoes. Do you know where they go? You're like, right there. What about your underwear? I mean, how'd that happen? You don't want to know. You don't want to know, right? Well, can we talk? You're like, sure, we could talk. Just don't stand in front of the TV. I mean, talk all you want, right? And you could just, yeah, I can keep going. You, you done yet? Okay, no, I'm all for you, right? Isn't that true? Come on, be honest, right? And the women are like, what happened? Right? What happened? hypocrisy that's what happened because we're in there and we're going to we're going to capture that beautiful woman that we've been wanting to have right and we did check we're done <laughs> i'm just saying i mean i don't know i've only been doing this for like a week and a half so this is all new i read in a book last night and so in a relationship you've got to throw away the hypocrisy and you have to be real right and, th and this is really where it takes us out of our comfort zone. Guys, the, they like that, the women are wired that way. And if we're going to get into their hearts, and we're going to have that, that intimate relationship with them, we have to be willing to do the things that they love to do. Right? And vice versa. Right, ladies? Y we're different. Guys are different than women. And, and if that relationship's going to thrive, we have to step out of our uh, out of our selfishness and step into the world, into their world. And so often in relationships, like my wife nags all the time. She nag, 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 nag. It's like, have you ever stopped and asked why? Oh. <laughs> right? 
no. It's like, maybe ask. I mean, maybe step back and ask, well, why is it? Right? Because, again, oftentimes in relationships, we don't know how to articulate our feelings. And so we just begin to say words, and it may not be healthy. Right? It may not be the right thing. And so we want to have that area without hypocrisy uh, in, our, in our life. All right? You all with me on that? So number six is that you got to be, uh, be authentic. <clears throat> and then verse 18, it says this. Peacemakers who sow in peace ri- raise a, what is it? A harvest of righteousness. Right? In, in the relationship, there is the character that reflects Jesus in it. And if you look at the marks of wisdom and you look at the character of Jesus, that's who you see. And he says, wouldn't it be great to invite Jesus' character to get into the relationships that you have at that dining room table that Christ would reflect in and through your life? And when you do that, you reap a harvest In other words, as you walk through life, you're planting. Is it unity or is it disunity? Is it truth or is it lies? You're planting. And what you sow is what you reap. And if you wonder what you sow, it's simple this. Just sit at your coffee, at your your table in your house, take take a deep breath, look at your house and ask yourself, is it chaotic or is it calm? That's it. Because if it's chaotic, you don't have godly wisdom in the relationship. Now, the good news is it doesn't have anything to do with a class. It doesn't have anything to do with your degree. It has to do with are you willing to invite it into your relationship. So look with me. A couple practical ways. If you go to James chapter 1, uh, verse 5, he tells us how we receive that wisdom. <clears throat> in verse, uh, verse 5, he says, if anyone... Who lacks wisdom. Anybody lack wisdom in here today? What should you do? You should ask God. And how does he give it to you? He gives it how? Generously. To all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. And so in your outline. Fill in the blank here. I must ask daily for God's wisdom. And this is the one thing that we need to recognize. That wisdom is not a one and done thing. So it's like, oh, I, I took that class, I'm done. No, you, you should ask for wisdom every time you're walking into an environment, right? And I, and I say this, hey, man, you should stop your car, dude, and you should park in the driveway or park around the street and, and park your car, turn off the radio, turn everything off, and take five minutes to ask God to come in to be a part of your life. Because you're walking into a situation, you need wisdom. And so you should ask for God's wisdom regularly, 10, 15, 20 times a day. That he would be invited into the environment in which you need wisdom. And certainly at the table as we're talking. And then the next one in your outline is that you must know Jesus personally. And I want to show you a different verse and then we're going to... Get ready to get out of here. In Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 2, here's what he says. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and, and, uh, and unity in love so that they may have the full riches of, of complete understanding in order that they may know the, uh, the mystery of God, namely who? Christ. Verse 3, pay attention. In whom are hidden all the... Of and Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. How is a house built? Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Where do we get it from? Jesus. Right? And if we're not willing to invite him into that relationship, then there's going to be chaos. Now, here's what I get with, with believers. It's like, I invited Jesus into my life. It's like, that's awesome. That's great. But here's what we need to recognize. Not only do we ask for wisdom moment by moment in every situation that we're walking into, but there's also a time in our life where every single day and every moment we surrender to Jesus. Right? You have a personal relationship with him. That's great. But you also have an old nature called the flesh. And surrendering is 
you're raising your hands. I mean, think about it in a military term. This is a universal sign of, I'm not going to fight you. In the military field, when someone raises their hand and they lift their hand up, what are they saying? Five minutes ago, I was going to fight you. I'm not going to fight you now. I'm going to surrender my will to that enemy army, military person. Spiritually, it's the same thing, isn't it? Spiritually, it's Jesus, I'm going to surrender to you. I have a will, I have a way, I have a wishes, I, have a, I want to fight you because I want my way. That's our nature. But Jesus, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm not going to fight you. I'm going to be obedient to what you're asking me to do. And when you do that, and this is so crucial, when you do, you invite the six marks of wisdom into your relationships. And the reason why is because the six marks of wisdom is a reflection of Jesus. And the only way that you have calmness in a house is by Christ. Surrendering and submitting to him. It's the only way where you can do that. Otherwise, there will be turbulence that is taking place. And we long for that environment. We long for having uh, no confusion and chaos and craziness. And Jesus is that answer. You want wisdom? Ask for it daily if you're a believer. Surrender to him. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that is the first step that you need to make. I'll bow your heads and close your eyes. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, <clears throat> I want to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And I've said this almost every week. It was the best decision that I've ever made in my entire life. He literally transformed my life, and I believe he can do that in yours as well. And we do that with a little ABC. There's no magical formula. It just kind of helps us stand track. A is admit that we're sinners. Every single one of us is sinners. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again, and C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And if your desire is to invite Christ into your life, just silently as I say this prayer, repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today I admit that I am a sinner, and I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again, and today I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray.